Uncle Fairfax, Mr. Keene. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A point of personal privilege. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the House, uh, I usually don't stand up a lot on the floor uh, because uh, I have this mentality that anything I have to share, you've probably heard before. And uh, all of us have a lot that we bring to this table. But uh, once in a while, I feel that I have a slightly different perspective on what happens both in this chamber as well as outside in our society uh, based on my experiences uh, growing up as an immigrant. And uh, last few days, we've heard from some of our colleagues about uh, African American History Month, which we celebrate every February for the last uh, uh, well, since 1926, when the first uh, African American History Week was uh, designated, uh, you, you know that February is a birth month for both uh, Abraham Lincoln and for Frederick Douglass, which of course uh, has significance for uh, all Americans, but in particular for African Americans. And so we've been celebrating it officially since 1976, when the president uh, declared this as a uh, month to honor African American history. And so we've been talking a lot about this over the last few days. We heard from some colleagues about wonderful, uh, uh, inspirational people who've made a difference as African Americans and also the struggles and the difficulties that they've had. And I've had a chance to think about this a lot uh, throughout my life, um, growing up as neither African American nor as Caucasian in this country. And what that means and the struggles that they've gone through for the last uh, two, three hundred years, how does that reflect on me today? And uh, it occurred to me that um, there's a direct linkage between the struggles that our forebears, our pioneers have gone through and the benefits that we enjoy today. So I thought I'd take a few moment, moments of this body's time to just explain a little bit about that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when I joined this body two years ago and since then, I've had uh, just an incredible, incredible uh, privilege to serve. But one of the most memorable conversations I've had with any colleague in this body was actually with, uh, with you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, two years ago when, uh, when I joined here, one day you asked if I'd be interested in uh, serving on the uh, uh, Virginia sesquicentennial of the American War, uh, Civil War Commission. And I had to do a double take. I, I stopped myself and I said, wait, you're talking about the Civil War Commission, the one that this uh, body established in 2006? And he says, yeah, I'd like you for you to serve on that. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't know if I bring any expertise to this. I, I wasn't born in Virginia. I, I wasn't even born in the country. Uh, I didn't go to schools in Virginia. And so I'm certainly not an expert in history of our uh, Commonwealth. And even though my mother's name is Nam Su Lee, I don't think the Lee family of Seoul, Korea is related to the Lee family of Stratford. And so I thought, you know, I, I don't know if I have any connections here that I can bring to the table. Uh, but uh, Mr. Speaker, you, uh, you said something which I'll never forget because you said uh, the Civil War happened 150 years ago. And we should certainly study it. We should certainly understand it. And we need to continue to, um, to talk about it. But we need to move beyond just those battles. We need to move beyond the conversations that divide us and look for things that unite us. And Mr. Speaker, you said this commission was about educating people so that we can move forward as a commonwealth together, looking at the next 150 years, not just looking back at the past 150 years. And you also said something which I thought was uh, uh, really, for me, very touching when you said, uh, Virginia is no longer just a black and white state. That we are a new Virginia, and you, Mark, uh, understand the new Virginia. And you bring a perspective to this uh, commission that we really need to make sure that we have a new Virginia, that we can all work together. And I thought that was a very progressive uh, view from you, Mr. Speaker, and I thought, you know, for that, I would be more than happy to, to serve on this commission. And so I've been honored to be part of this uh, for the last two years, having a chance to attend a lot of commemorative events and, and studying and meeting uh, people who are experts like uh, Bart Robertson and others. So uh, it's been really enjoyable. And I know the members that serve on this commission with me, uh, uh, Delegate Sajuanu and Hal, Hal, Algie Howell and uh, Delegate Scott Linkenfelder, Scott Garrett and uh, Tommy Wright. You probably know the motto of this commission because uh, I wore this pin today uh, to remind me, but the motto of the commission is understanding our past and embracing our future. Understanding our past and embracing our future. And for us to really understand where we are today as a commonwealth and embracing the future that's coming to us, I think we have to understand some of the significant legal changes that have happened in the last few few uh, dozen years that really have an impact on not only today as Virginians, but the future of Virginians. Because you see, Mr. Speaker, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the House, we all know the struggles of the African Americans going back pre-Civil War days, the slavery and the dark periods that we've had, the evils of how humans treated other humans in that way. And it took a massive war to stop that, at least by law. And yet discrimination still continued at the end of the Civil War. And even though Congress passed the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments to, in law, codify the fact that we don't discriminate, that we don't 
allow slavery, that we don't allow for people of different backgrounds to be treated differently. The court still, year after year, overruled that. And separate but equal was still the law of the land, even though we had laws on the books that said, no, that's illegal. And so it took another 100 years until the 1960s, when the 64 Civil Rights Act, when the 65 Voting Rights Act, and all those uh, projects since then, and, and the courts at that time that opened up the opportunities for Americans. It wasn't until then that we really had more of a civil rights, more of an equal uh, treatment and fairness in this country. And to this day, 50 years after that experience, we dare say that we don't quite have equality across the board, but we're struggling, but we're, str we're getting to get there. We're working towards that more perfect union that's been promised. But Mr. Speaker, as we think about the struggles that the African Americans have had to endure, the sacrifices, the deaths, the bloodshedding that happened over the last 200, 300 years, there's another period of this history that most of us probably don't know, and most of us probably have never thought about. And that is the history of Asian Americans in the United States. There have been Asian Americans in this country since the 1800s, the early 1800s. In fact, there are Asian Americans that fought in the Civil War on both sides, or at least worked during that, that period uh, supporting the, the, the soldiers of both sides. And the Asian Americans, while, we were, while they were here, small in number, were discriminated against just like African Americans. Not only in fact, but in law. In 1882, Congress passed a law that says the Chinese shall not be allowed to immigrate here. They shall not have any rights. They shall have no legal protections whatsoever. And if you leave here, you can't come back. It's called the Chinese Exclusion Act, which in uh, 1946, I think it was repealed. But at least for 56 years, that was a law of the land. In 1924, Congress also passed a law called the National Origins Act, which said, let's expand it to all Asian groups whether you're a Filipino-American, Korean-American, Japanese-American, wherever you're from, if you're not from North Europe, we're not going to allow you to be part of American dream. And so there was a law on the books for many, many generations that forbade, prohibited Asian-Americans from being full equal partners in this country. And so it wasn't until all the struggles that we saw in the 1950s of the pioneers that we've had, uh, the Booker T. Washington, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, all the, all the incredible leaders who've turned this country to where it is, and the leaders that we had in the, in the 20th century, of course we know about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, but we also know about gentlemen like Algie Howe and Senator Yvonne Miller and Senator Henry Marsh, who've opened doors, who've opened doors for all of us over those struggles. It wasn't until they did their part to open those doors that in 1965 Congress finally passed the Immigration and Naturalization Act. And that 1965 law, Mr. Speaker, is significant because it was the first time in the history of our great nation, first time in our history, where our immigration laws finally reflected the same principles that we've adhered since the beginning, which is that all people of all backgrounds, of all colors, of all origins, from all over the world can come here equally and have the same rights to become an American. So for the first time in history in 1965, we Americans allowed for immigration from beyond Europe. We allowed Asian immigrants, we allowed Latino immigrants, we allowed African immigrants. As a result of that, Mr. Speaker, in 1980, my family left our shores and came to this country. I would not be standing here literally in front of you today if it wasn't for the 1965 Act, which allowed for immigration. And that 65 Act would not have been possible if it wasn't for the struggles that African Americans have done to pave the way for all of us. You see, Mr. Speaker, the benefits I enjoy and my, my generation enjoys in miles were gained by these pioneers in inches. And so I think if you think about embracing our future together as Virginian with a fast growing population of Asian Americans, Latino Americans, I think we really have to understand the history of how we got here and understand that we are, whether we like it or not, we are gonna be one un united uh, Commonwealth together. So the, the question is how does this body, this General Assembly come up with the policies that respect, acknowledge that, and at the same time try to develop laws that will reflect both in fact and in law that unity and equality that's promised under the Constitution. So with that, Mr. Speaker, uh, as we celebrate Black History Month, I just wanted to sh share a few uh, thoughts of my own, and I indulge, ask, uh, ask for your indulgence of my time. And uh, thank you so much. Let's go celebrate Black History Month.